All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Jody Shahada, who is the founder of Shahada Law, a LA-based law firm that represents talent and media and entertainment companies worldwide. Jody, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thanks so much for asking. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start with just telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Yeah, so I been I'm an entertainment lawyer. I've been practicing for about 13 years now. Um, I started my career doing justice. I went to law school just to do this type of uh, legal practice, and so I've I've spent my career representing talent, celebrities, uh, entertainment companies, music managers, executives everyone active in the music and entertainment world. Um, and so I, I am very fortunate to have been able to pursue that career in my opinion. And I was a partner for a number of years at a, another entertainment law firm. And then I started my own firm uh, in the peak of the pandemic <laughs> in 2020. And um, it's been a fast growing firm ever since and loving every day of it. Yeah. So how do you go about growing a firm? Do you, is it a lot of marketing or is it more relationships based? At least in entertainment, it's all relationships based. Uh, we consider ourselves a bit of an insular community, um, you know, because of the nature of our work, because of the the, the people who we represent, uh, we, you know, we do tend to have a very strong referral base. So that's how I've been growing it uh, for the last really since I've, I've been building my book of business for gosh, about seven years now, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, awesome. What do you like to do for fun outside of saving people's butts? <laughs> <laughs> I would say the things that I like to do for fun that also keep me sane are I am very active in exercise and movement that really helps clear my mind each day. Uh, when I can, I meditate. <laughs> I have a two-year-old toddler, baby girl. Um, you know, so my my non-work hours really do revolve around her. And uh, you know, otherwise, we lo really love to get out to enjoy. You know, the nature of LA offers hiking, trying to get to the beach. Uh, we just bought a house recently, so designing yeah. and furnishing that. So it's fun. We've got a, a pretty well-rounded life here and of course seeing friends whenever I can <laughs> there we go there we go I love it and tell us a bit more about your motivation what really gets you up and keeps you going every day honestly I love what I do I've always since I was a very young age um probably in my teens I always knew I wanted to work in music I just absolutely resonated with that form of art and it personally got me through a lot of you know, tough times. And I just knew that I always really wanted to help pe those people who are making music. And so my motivation has been to help those people truly, uh, to keep making music, seeing how music can, you know, really save lives, make an impact for others and uh, inspire political movements just the wide reach that music can have and to have a very small role in helping that get out into the world, that truly is my motivation. Uh, I wouldn't be a lawyer if I wasn't an entertainment lawyer, <laughs> let's just say. And, and so the fact that I get to keep doing this on a daily basis is truly mo the motivation that keeps me going. I gotcha. So does the day-to-day -day of being an entertainment lawyer, is it very similar to being a criminal lawyer or any other type of lawyer, or is it very different um, in like paperwork and how trials and settlements go? And I don't know the world of a lawyer, honestly. <laughs> yeah. You can elaborate on the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, absolutely. The day-to-day -day for me is I'm a, uh, I'm a transactional lawyer, so I'm only doing deal negotiations. I am reviewing contracts. I'm advising clients on you know, the pros and cons of doing this type of deal and negotiating with other lawyers on the other side to make that deal happen. Um, in my world, uh, I'm, I'm also, unfortunately, because of the, the stature of my clients, I'm dealing with a lot of frivolous sample claims. So, you know, a lot, some people will reach out and, and claim that one of my clients 
infringed one of their songs. And I work very closely with the litigator to defend and show that that claim is uh, meritless and they're not going to win. Um, but because of the fact that I am a transactional lawyer, I don't go to court, fingers crossed. Um, although I was summoned for jury duty that I have to do soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's, that's a huge difference with my type of practice versus uh, someone, a litigator who actually does go to court. Um, also working in entertainment, it's a blend of a, a number of different types of law practices. So there's my copyright practice, there's transactional contract work, there's um, sometimes immigration work, sometimes uh, corporate work, uh, employment law. Um, it really does blend a lot of different practices, whereas some lawyers truly just focus on you know, just corporate or just real estate. And so I think that that's also something that keeps entertainment law very interesting on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. And um, deal negotiations. So you really have to understand how the money flows in the music industry to negotiate well. Exactly. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it's a lot of paying attention to the things that aren't as quote unquote interesting. Uh, for instance, the royalties and how they're calculated. Um, how are the accounting set up? Because if, you know, you don't have those full accounting provision and protections. That means your royalties are likely not going to be coming through, tracking to make sure that the royalties are coming through on a, on a regular basis as they're supposed to be, um, you know, because that's what gives life to the revenue that's generated from the deals that I'm doing. So not only is it the advances and the upfront fees and licensing fees, but it's also, you know, that back end, uh, you know, the little bells and whistles, um, regarding royalties and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. And are you paid like on a retainer basis? Do you get a percent of deals negotiated if you can disclose that? I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So typically with entertainment lawyers, uh, they are paid on a commission basis of, of entertainment earnings. Uh, that is because of the unique role that we play with our clients. So we very much are, and, and this is, and this is me speaking personally. Um, I work very closely with the client's team. So very closely with the manager, the business manager, the talent agent, and myself, we, we, the four of us in our roles are, are really, you know, the dream team, so to speak. And we're all supposed to be working collectively to help build a client's career. So that means, you know, negotiating really strong deals. It means protecting them in, situations where, you know, they get into trouble, like a, you know, a sample claim or something, um, you know, watching out to make sure that, you know, I get really involved, I get really hands into uh, the work of my clients, you know, making sure that, you know, invoice working closely with the business manager to make sure that invoices are being properly paid on time, um, making sure that, the songs are being registered properly so that the royalties are getting tracked. Uh, and all of that work is not necessarily attached to a, a fee with a deal, right? It's just, this is the type of legal work that's needed in order for the, the artist to uh, have their career scale, but, and also how they're building wealth. And that's a, a huge focus for me. Um, you know, there are times where it makes more sense to charge a flat fee per agreement. Or, you know, some of my media companies, I might, you know, be on a monthly retainer or an hourly basis. But for me, with especially with talent representation, it's so important that we have that open communication. Uh, and I don't ever want them to feel like they can't call me or uh, reach out to me because they're worried that I have to charge, you know, the minimum like 15 minutes of time. Um, so for me, that's, yeah, that's where the commission basis really works out. And I think that's, that's, pretty much the standard with entertainment lawyers. I gotcha. And what is the, what's your ideal client look like? And for example, there are a lot of beginner musicians. I would assume you're not representing people who are like writing their first song in their basement right now. And <laughs> so what does your ideal client look like? And what does the ideal client relationship look like? Yeah, the ideal client is one that has longevity. So either they've been in the business for a long time and they've been able to 
scale their career out of music and into global entertainment work. So are active in film in some sort of capacity or active in television. They have their own brand lines. They they have passive income. They they have companies that they've formed. Uh, they're an entrepreneur. And that to me shows that not only are, do they have extreme talent, they've got amazing work ethic. They've made the right choices with the types of teams that they're putting together. And they've been able to weather the storm over a few, you know, years and decades, you know, the inevitably during the course of a career for a creative, there's going to be peaks and valleys. They're going to have years of profound, um, you know, success. And then there's going to be years where, you know, they might go through a creative dry spell and how do they, how do we work together to get them through that? Are they setting up companies where they're receiving passive income? Um, you know, are they, exploring other interests that they might have by pursuing merch lines or, uh, you know, other types of um, doorways that are open to them because they are successful musicians or um, successful artists. And so to me, that type of long-term potential is what makes someone a dream client um, because, you know, you can definitely get in there with a quick, you know, artist that, you know, might be having a hit right now, but you're really not sure if they have the uh, stamina to to last for a decade or so. Um, and that's fine. It's just for me personally, just the, the way that I work, I, I love that team mentality of representation with artists and to be able to build something over time and, and have it be a real team success. That's what differentiates it for me. Um, you know, I do definitely have developing talent. So, you know, whether it's a great producer or a songwriter or a new artist. But uh, to me, what makes a difference is do they have the right team around them? Do I know their managers? Are their managers, you know, ones that I would invest and bet my time on and my my team's time on in, in working on this client? And, you know, some absolutely are worth it. And so, yeah, we represent people at the very beginning stages of their careers and ones that have been around for decades and, helped you know everyone in between yeah i got you and i guess the commission only structure lends to that right so mm -hmm. you can kind of be with yeah. somebody on the come up and that's cool it's really cool yeah I, I guess that's where you know it comes down to that motivation you know the daily motivation is being working with someone and seeing their success grow and being with them while that happens and and having feeling like it's a real communal win uh, hearing their song on the radio, I still get you know, so excited about. So, uh, you know, that's that's where it all ties in. I love it. Well, what are your dreams and goals? Tell us about your vision for your life and your business. Dreams and goals, I would say for my life. Um, I mean, look, really, it's pretty basic. I'd love to have a long, healthy life and have my children have the same and see my grandchildren one day uh, if they choose to have kids. I think that that, you know, all in all would be pretty successful life personally. Yeah. Um, and same with my husband. <laughs> I didn't mean to <laughs> leave him out. <laughs> um, and then for my, for my firm, for my career, uh, you know, this, it's been almost three years since I started this firm, which is just mind blowing to me because it went by so fast. Uh, and, you know, each year the team has grown and it's a really strong, powerful, dynamic young team. And um, right now it, it happens to be an all female team and, and it, you know, I'm sure it won't last like that. Um, and it's not that that's intentional, but it just happens to be that way right now. And uh, it's, you know, we're, we're growing, we're, we're bringing on more and more interesting clients. It's diversifying as far as the clientele goes. Uh, I would love to keep that pace up. That's the goal really professionally is to just continue to do good work, continue to do efficient work. Um, you know, so many of our clients come to us because we are really efficient in negotiating the strong deals, but, but understanding that time is money and, if people aren't closing their deals, then no one's getting paid. And that again, comes down to 
the billing structure of us all being on commission. We're all in this together. And so I would love for the firm to just continue its pace and to, you know, ultimately reach about 10 to 15 attorney practice. Right now we're at um, two looking to hire over the summer and uh, plus we have staff and uh, just to keep growing like, like that and to have artists that are punning out meaningful and important work that is inspiring others and making a real difference in the conversation. Yeah. I love it. What are, um, are you able to tell us who, uh, I'm not even going to ask that. It's a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. Forget I asked. Um, Let's just say I work with a lot of clients whose music you hear on the radio and, and my, my history is working with a lot of people that you've all heard on the radio. <laughs> um, that's really and cool. seen on TV and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> does, does any part of you fangirl ever with the clients that you have? Yes. <laughs> um, definitely. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and then especially you know when you see them you know performing and you're backstage and literally on the stage watching them perform I definitely can fangirl and be like oh pinch me moment this is so cool that this is my life yeah. <laughs> all these years later <laughs> yeah that is awesome <laughs> that is so cool uh can you tell us a little bit about negotiating like you got you talked about how you guys are really strong with negotiating these deals what are like how do you approach negotiations in the industry and how do you make sure you're getting a good deal for everybody involved? Mm -hmm. So before the negotiations start and I have either the offer or we're coming together um, and starting to think about what it is that we want for, for a specific deal, uh, it's really important that I know what the market is. So understanding what other similar artists in, in the artist capacity, um, if we're, we're looking at like an artist deal, understanding what similar artists are uh, receiving from similar companies or the same company that we're about to negotiate and negotiate with. And um, so that way I'm prepared. I've done my research, uh, you know, and also really know, and it comes back to that really close client relationship, knowing what the client wants right now, knowing what the client needs right now, financially, deal structure wise, you know, uh, bells and whistles versus where do they need to be in five years from now? If, you know, maybe even 10 years from now, depending on how long this deal might last. Um, and thinking about how we get there, how do we get a really strong deal right now? And that sets this client up for being in a strong bargaining power or position five to 10 years from now. Um, so it's a real balance. And then once the negotiations start, you know, my style is um, for me as the, you know, transactional deal maker, to me, I view the, my role is getting the deal done. You know, there's two parties here. They want to get a deal done. How do we get it done so that it's as strong as possible for my client, but also that's enough for success. And sometimes if it's too one-sided, honestly, even towards my client, in some ways, and with that long-term focus, it, it could uh, hinder them and start the relationship off with a ton of pressure on them to perform and to deliver. And sometimes that is a lot to ask of a client to, or to put a client in that position because maybe they're just starting out in their careers and this is their one shot. And if they yeah. get this massive deal that, you know, they release one single and it doesn't connect the way that that label needs it to, that puts a real scarlet A on my client for their ability to grow and develop as an artist. So thinking about all of that, when I go into the negotiations and, um, Sorry, I lost you for a sec. Um, thinking about all that when I go into the negotiations and, and trying to find that balance and come to the negotiation table, understanding that people want a deal to happen. And I, my, my approach stylistically is to 
be positive and professional, pay extreme attention to detail and try to get it done if that's what the client wants. You know, and we'll have very strong conversations about, you know, my, my concerns about a certain deal, how we can make it better, but ultimately the client's the boss. And if the client wants a deal done, I will get it done as strongly as possible for them with as many protections as I can. Um, you know, there's a lot of different styles when, for lawyers when it comes to negotiation. And uh, I would say that my end goal is to get the deal to done, to get the deal done as strongly as possible, but in a position where both people walk away feeling like they got something out of it. Cause that to me, in my experience is what sets the relationship up uh, for success on the line. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like your long-term perspective on it and realizing that there are two parties involved and you want to make sure that the relationship is good long-term. So you're not trying to squeeze them for every penny in the beginning or put huge expectation on your client in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I really like that approach to it. Okay. Well, awesome. Thanks for that deep dive <laughs> and little masterclass on negotiation. Tell us about some of the skills that you need to develop right now to make some of these dreams and goals come true, specifically to hit that 10 to 15 attorney practice. Um, physically, if I could figure out how to get less than six hours of sleep a night, that would be wonderful <laughs> <laughs> in order to be able to function on that. Um, otherwise, you know, work, work-wise, it's, it's just about being disciplined. It's about, for me, um, you know, being able, especially now becoming a mom and, uh, have been able to time block, honestly, during the day is been really, really important. Um, that really helps with discipline, uh, being able to just truly focus during those hours and, uh, you know, being able to balance the day where some days are more meeting based, some days are more just sitting in front of my computer and plowing through the agreements that I have to handle um, or knowing when to delegate and engage the team. Um, as far as character traits in order to maintain or, and to build that, I think it's if I can keep up that discipline so that I have a headspace to think bigger, think broader, think more creatively about opportunity expansion um, and, you know, being, having the headspace to let those light bulbs go off, I think is going to be really critical for scaling the business over, over time. I got you. I got you. And how many attorneys do you guys have at the practice right now? You said you're hiring on two more and will that put you, are you like the main one and then you have staff and then you'll be at a three attorney? I don't, I'm not clear on what an attorney practice is. Yeah. Like um, attorney is, <laughs> yeah, no, attorney is someone who has gone to law school or and passed the bar exam in that state where they're practicing. So uh, with that, we've, uh, there's two attorneys, including myself, there's a paralegal, um, and going to be hiring another attorney this summer. Um, and pretty much averaging one, adding one attorney to the the roster uh, about every year that that has felt like very good sustainable growth for us um, and then we're also very active with running an intern program um, I throughout my career I've always had an intern program um, some of them have gone on to have really successful careers in this business which I think is just the best thing ever um, I started my career out by being an intern at a variety of different places. And so to me, the internship uh, program is really, really important for mentoring that next um, that next chapter of, in, of, of uh, attorneys in the business. I gotcha, I gotcha. So it's not necessarily name partners, like their name's gonna be next to yours, but it's like just attorneys who can practice law. Right, exactly. You know, if there's um, ever an opportunity to if it makes sense ever to bring uh, to partner with a corporate lawyer who just focuses on corporate law or, um, you know, someone who has a certain book of business and an expertise beyond mine, I think that that would definitely be um, probably an important um, step for growth for the company. And um, so, yeah, thinking bigger, broader, you know, down the line about how to 
expand those services um, more fully so that we can offer our clients. I got you. I got you. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I was thinking of my only reference for attorneys is suits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't wear a suit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. In suits, name partner was a really big deal. So I thought you meant yeah. like into 15 name partners. I was like, that seems like a lot. <laughs> No, that would be huge. No, I, I think all all together, associate attorneys, you know, partners, all together being 10 to 15 people would be fantastic. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thinking bigger, thinking broader and thinking more creatively about opportunity expansion, give us your top two to three ideas right now that are the most creative ways you can expand opportunity that have kind of been in the back of your head. Maybe you haven't given them like a lot of fuel because you've been in the weeds, but. Yeah, there's so many. Um, <laughs> well, one is, I mean, like I, I just touched on is, is bringing on different uh, lawyers that have different expertise and book of business that, um, you know, we can really share our resources and our knowledge, you know, for instance, you know, we're a boutique firm and being able to, offer a full-time, you know, corporate lawyer to do that type of work where we can cross, uh, collaborate. And, um, you know, I think personally, it's just really good to be able to bounce ideas off of someone like that and, and vice versa. Um, creatively speaking, uh, another idea I have is, you know, just expanding, you know, being in LA, there's so many amazing opportunities here for networking and just to continue to do that so that I can, you know, for instance, like I know some of my clients are really passionate about cooking and how could we potentially make a connection for them in some sort of cooking space, whether it's a cookbook or a restaurant or, you know, just knowing what it is that my clients are excited about and then using that networking opportunity being in LA to uh, expand on that. Um, you know, and then there's other, you know, I think the prospect of figuring out AI right now, um, you know, a lot of people are very scared about it or overwhelmed by it. Uh, you know, figuring out how that could potentially be harnessed and a w in a way that is great for a law firm, but also responsibly. So I'm still, I'm playing around with that notion and, and seeing how potentially what opportunities with AI could, could help a law firm. Um, so yeah, that's just a, those are a couple of, couple of ideas off the top of my head. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. So AI, some networking opportunities like catered to client interests and then partnering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have you ever you, or, oh go for it I was gonna say you have to be a bit careful though with the partnering and the growth in that way because otherwise you know I started the firm because I had you know worked in this business for a, a long time before that and I'd seen how all of you know for the most part all of the law firms that were formed at the time operated and um, relatively speaking, I'm, I'm pretty young for my career and being able to start my own firm as a woman owned, woman managed firm, um, having that type of different perspective on entertainment law firms and wanting to do it a little differently. That's something that's really important to me about what we're doing at Shahada Law and, making sure that the growth is sustainable and the partnering is strategic and curated. And so we're not getting too far away from what that initial uh, position was really when for why I started the firm and the, the type of work culture that I want to, uh, you know, support. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious if, um, law firms in the entertainment industry ever grow through acquisition of other books of businesses of other law firms absolutely. in the entertainment industry? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think I get propositioned once a year at least if I'm <laughs> going to buy my practice and go 
be in a big law firm. <laughs> um, I gotcha. So it would just kind of roll into there. Complimentary, but yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. Are you at Are you at a point where there are law firms smaller than you that you could buy, or is it more like you would have to grow a little bit more before you could start rolling in other books of business? Um, there are certain solo practitioner practices um, that are out there that. Uh, you know, that could potentially be a possibility. Um, I'm not really interested in, in buying someone's practice, though. Um, it would be more of a collaborative, this makes a lot of sense, let's, let's merge our strengths, um, let's use each other uh, to present stronger client services. Um, yeah, so I think that's more what I'm interested in rather than just going out and acquiring a practice. I gotcha. I gotcha. Well, if there were one or two people you could meet right now, and this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take that next step towards these dreams and goals, who would they be and how would they help you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I really admire this uh, this woman uh, business owner named Aurora James. Uh, she started this company, Brother Valleys, uh, based in Brooklyn, uh, where I spent a number of years living. And um, she's just got this incredible life story where she is a designer. She uh, started out in um, fashion and um, has a very targeted, uh, how do I describe it, a uh, motto for her company where the company, uh, sells shoes and other, you know, art of, um, other products that are built sustainably and ethically in uh, artisan, art, uh, artisan communities throughout the world. So Kenya, South Africa, um, Ethiopia, Mexico, and, you know, her goal is to really take on the concept of fast fashion and how detrimental it is to the environment. So not only is she doing that with her business, which I think is just wonderful and her business is, is really, really cool and interesting, but she then, um, you know, right after the George Floyd mur murder, she started this incredible nonprofit called 15% Sledge. And basically the, the goal for the, for the nonprofit is to um, uh, pressure companies like Whole Foods, Target, Shop Shop, all these big re retailers to make space on their shelves for black owned um, products. And, you know, arguing that uh, black, the black population is about 15% of the U S population. And yet the uh, black owned products that are being sold at these retailers, I think are like 1% <laughs> yeah. of all of the, you know, things being sold. Um, and so she's really trying to change the conversation, put money literally into the families of, you know, and into the hands of the um, black entrepreneurs. And I think that, and it's just been incredibly successful. Like so far Nordstrom's has signed on, Sephora, um, Rent the Runway, I believe. And, and it's this commitment that they make every year to audit all of their, all of their products, everything that they're selling, and making sure that 15% of them is from a black owned company. Um, and then not to mention just, you know, she's, I don't, I don't know how she accomplishes everything that she does during the day, but I think it's, she's definitely one of my, my people that I would love to sit down and have lunch with one day. Um, and the second I would say is Jane Fonda. I think that she's so rad. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? I think that Jane Fonda. <laughs> oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I would say that she is, uh, you know, I just think she's had such an incredible career. She's so entrepreneurial. Um, you know, she's just so badass in her, you know, fight for justice and environmental right, you know, protections. And um, yeah, I, I would love to sit down with her as well. <laughs> I gotcha. There we go. Well, now we got our thriving three. And our first question is, what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. <laughs> Oh, it's really hard to choose a favorite um, for any of these because I feel like it changes through different chapters of life. But I would say that the 
book that I absolutely cannot put down recently was Lessons in Chemistry. Um, and I'm sorry, her her name is escaping me right now, the author's name. But um, it's just this amazing, it's just such a great fiction read. And, and I never get to read fiction. So the fact that I got the opportunity to read a fiction book was really exciting. Um, and it's all about this uh, female chemist in the 1950s who, uh, it, long story short, she, you know, all the, um, the obstacles that she encountered being a woman in that field at that time of the country and was and segued into having this very successful television cooking show anyway it's fantastic read <laughs> there we go and i couldn't put it down um by bonnie this, Garmis. yes is that it yeah i think you're right <laughs> I has, it, has so. an orange cover yeah <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, for podcasts, I absolutely love um, Mo News, M-O News. He's um, this news broadcaster who uh, has had, you know, big history in CBS and been a reporter for a number of years. And actually during the pandemic, his Instagram account was starting, um, was showing all of these this curated news headlines across all sorts of media um, news outlets and summarized in you know one short little Instagram story for each article and just the articles that he would post were so interesting it was just a really quick easy way to get the news digest it understand like have a good understanding of what your you know what was going on in the world that day and um he has just been my news resource and so he has a pod a daily podcast for the news so i listen to mo news almost every day um on my drive to work and i'm sorry what was the third one you wanted to know <laughs> movie movie uh i would say probably my all-time favorite was high fidelity i just watched it a million times over and over since I was a teenager and I worked in a record shop. So that really resonated with me. Um, you know, and I, you know, who doesn't love John Cusack? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like a music nerd movie and I absolutely love it. <laughs> there we go. And what's one way you like to take care of yourself? Um, the, probably the non-negotiable I would say is, is some sort of exercise or movement i to six times a week it's really hard to get it in even if it's just 20 minutes a day um just something it's if I can get it done in the morning it just makes the whole day so much better um if I have some more time I used to have a really dedicated meditation practice um I followed tm um since having a baby that you know has been a lot harder to be consistent with but I'm trying to get back into it <laughs> And um, honestly, just sometimes taking a walk outside, just getting outside, getting some fresh air, walking is the way that I think the best and the ideas come to me. And um, so if I can, you know, be disciplined enough to get outside and walk and do that, that those are very easy, but uh, effective self-care regimens for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like a good walk. I ne I didn't. Uh... Yeah. I used to not realize how good it felt to just get out and walk. Maybe it's because I was always out yeah. because I was playing football. But oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You enter adult life and you're in front of a computer a lot of the day and it's like, dude, walking just hits different. I know, I know. It's ugh, it's uh who would have thought it would be so hard to just build in some time to go outside for a walk, but yep, yep, yep. yep. It can be. And what is one action step you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to meet either Aurora James or Jane Fonda? <laughs> um, networking. I, and, I, and I really, I mean, fortunately in the world that I, I work in, it, we're, we're not that far apart, likely. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's just, yeah, just networking, um, you know, making that connection for the person that introduces us one day and I, I'm I'm confident it'll happen one time. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And now we got our final series of questions, real quick. Um, mm -hmm. You can pass on these if you want to, because they can get a bit personal. Just let me know if you want to pass. Yeah. What is one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life, if any? 
That's a great question. Um, that's a hard question. Uh, I would say that, you know, I, I've worked really, really hard as a business owner to eradicate the limiting, limiting beliefs that I've had, um, because they can be so detrimental. And my business is being strong and having a clear mind for my clients so that I can effectively navigate their deal making. And if I am operating by some sort of, you know, limiting belief that's holding me back in some way, uh, it's really going to affect my work performance for them. So I've worked very, very hard to get rid of that. Um, you know, plus, you know, not only that, but growing a company, having employees that rely on me, um, having a, a daughter that relies on me and a family, it's, and starting this business in the peak of the pandemic, there's, there's just no room for any sort of limiting belief that would be, affect, you know, that type of performance demanded of me, honestly, on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, historically, sure, I mean, luck as, as a new attorney starting out, are always going to, I would say, you're always going to have, uh, you know, those self doubts about if you, you can put in the hours that are needed, if you're cut out for this, um, you know, that those are probably some of the ones I had, you know, starting out in my career, but, you know, I've been doing this 13 years. So it's, you got to get rid of those at some point. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. therapy, you know, therapy, meditation, whatever it is that works for you, you, you have to let go of those or oh, work gosh. through them. I got you. Love it. And what is your favorite belief about yourself? Um, it, okay. Again, getting back to the fact that the, I started this thing in <laughs> the pandemic, um, and was, uh, pregnant shortly thereafter with my first child. And I very much know that if I have any sort of tough situation that I'm facing right now, or if life is just being life and a ton of things are coming at me, I know for a fact that I can get through it. <laughs> and I say, you know what, you, you, you left your previous job, you started this company, you built it, you know, and it was profitable from day one. You've had exponential growth ever since you felt brought on a team. You can, you had a baby throughout all of it. There's literally nothing you can't do. So that was a great learning experience. And also my, you know, now my mantra. <laughs> there we go. Love it. Uh, well, awesome. Jody. that's all we got for you. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? No, it was so nice to talk to you, Timothy. And look, I love your show. And it's been such a pleasure to, to come on board, to come chat with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, it's been great to have you. And if you guys are listening to this and you loved what Jody had to say, make sure to hit her up. If you know any music artists that are on the come up and need some representation, go ahead and send them Jody's <laughs> Um, yeah, of course, definitely. maybe send them to a manager that Jody trusts first. So the manager, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. drop, drop some names. We'll know, we'll know them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. We will see you on the next one. All the ways to contact Jody will be down in the show notes. And on that note, we're out. <laughs>